is everybody having a good time so far? PyCon? Yeah? Good. So uh, by a show of hands before I start, how many of you have heard of Rust before today? Oh, wow, almost everyone. OK. And keep your hands up, actually, if you've used it for anything. OK, maybe a quarter of you? OK. So why am I at a Python conference speaking about a completely different language? Alan Perlis, the first recipient of the Turing Award, once said that a language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. This is a statement that really resonates with me. And for me, Rust has been a language that has really changed my way of thinking about programming. Rust is a systems language that combines the speed and the control of lower level languages like C with the safety and the expressive power of higher level languages like Python. Today, I'm going to be talking about why I'm so excited about Rust as a language. I'll give you a brief introduction to Rust and how it works. And then I'll talk about two of its features that I find most compelling, its type system and then the concept of ownership and borrowing. And then at the end, I'll talk about how you can use Rust alongside of Python to speed up critical parts of your code. I've been using Python now for over 10 years. And coming from a background of C and C Sharp, I was really amazed with how easy to use and how functional the uh, Python was. And I've been, it, I fell in love with it as soon as I started using it. And it's been my favorite language for most tasks ever since. Uh, Python has a mature ecosystem. Uh, and there's a library for doing almost anything you can think of. But most of all, uh, Python has a really welcoming and diverse and passionate community that I'm really proud to be a part of. But I think there are good reasons to learn other languages. And one is just to deepen your understanding of uh, and the theory and the craft of programming and of computer science. And the next is just to expand your tool belt. So Python is a great language for most use cases, but there's some cases where it's not necessarily the right tool for the job. And actually, I just recently read an article um, by, uh, how, about how Sentry used uh, Rust to uh, speed up their source map parsing component. So that's just one example of when you might want to uh, use a different language. But most of all, I just find it really fun. I think it's rewarding uh, to learn new ideas and to apply new uh, techniques to solve, towards solving real world problems. And Rust has a number of killer features that are, I'm really excited about. And that's why I'm talking about it today. The first is that it has a, a strong type system. So something that I've been noticing in dynamic languages uh, is that they've, they seem to be moving more towards static typing. So actually, we can see that the announcement of MyPy at PyCon in 2016. Uh, and also, the JavaScript world is starting to move more towards um, static languages like TypeScript or Elm, and even with static type checkers like uh, Flow. Rust also provides uh, memory safety. Uh, and it provides freedom from data races. And these are both provided by the type checker. And uh, finally, it also provides uh, zero cost abstraction. So things that you're used to in high-level languages, like iterators or closures or even pattern matching, Rust is able to uh, have these, but without any runtime cost. And it, is, and it uses LLVM, uh, the compiler infrastructure, in order to optimize that away to almost nothing. So I really think that uh, Rust is a great language. So if, you're already, if you already know Python and you're looking to go deeper, I would really recommend uh, learning it. And even if you never actually end up using it for anything, I think its concepts can apply to uh, your everyday work. So let's start looking at the language. Let, let's look at some code. Um, here's a simple Hello World program in Rust. The first thing you'll notice is a function called main. This is the first one that gets called when your program starts. And we're using the fn keyword, which is like def in Python. And on the next line, we have a variable or a name binding called greet. And we're setting this to the value world. And the name uh, variable is a bit misleading in Rust, because actually, um, variables are immutable by default, meaning once they're assigned, you can't change them. Uh, and the second thing is that this, uh, you'll, you'll notice I'm not actually specifying any types here. The Rust compiler has type inference, meaning that it can guess the types for your variables uh, uh, based on how they're used. So on the next line, we're printing uh, hello with a format string. This is uh, very similar to Python's format strings. Uh, and this exclamation point that you see is actually uh, what's called a macro. So I don't have too much time to talk about macros today, but what they are is uh, 
if you use C, the preprocessor for C has macros, but one advantage that Rust has over C's preprocessor uh, is that instead of operating just on the text, it operates on the parsed syntax trees from the compiler, which I think is really cool. And we'll see an example of that when I talk about how to extend Python. So here's a more complex example. Uh, this is a function which uh, returns the average of a list of 64-bit floating point uh, values. And so here we're uh, putting the types explicitly on the function. And the reason is that Rust isn't able to infer or won't infer types across function call boundaries. So for functions, these are required. Uh, and here we have a mutable variable, so a variable called total that we're going to change uh, as the function runs. We loop through each element in the list. Uh, you'll notice there's no parentheses, so it's a bit different than C, but it's, it looks a bit more like Python. And then for each element, we add it to the total. But first, we have to dereference it using the star operator. And the reason is that uh, when this function is called, it doesn't actually receive all of the data. It receives a pointer or a reference to that data. And when you loop through each element, you actually have a pointer to each successive element. And so in order to get at the value, you have to dereference it. And then finally, we divide it by the length. Uh, and there's no return statement here. In Rust, the last uh, expression in a function is automatically used as the return value. So this is what's called the declarative uh, style, sorry, the imperative style of programming. So that means that you're telling the computer explicitly which steps to take to achieve a result. So higher level languages normally provide uh, abstractions that let you be more uh, descriptive rather than prescriptive about how to achieve uh, a task. And the reason that's good is that it frees the interpreter to decide on how, or the, the compiler, on how to actually implement um, and how to do the execution plan. So if you were to write this in Python, you would probably say, uh, just give me the sum of the items and then divide it by the length. And you can do that in Rust, too. So Rust has these abstractions like iterators. So what I do now is I ask for an iterator over this array. I ask for its sum, as a, and then I type annotate it with a 64-bit floating point, and then uh, divide by the length, like before. So this works, and it's actually the same speed as uh, the other one. And the benefit of this, of writing it in this declarative style, is that it's also easier to parallelize. And Rust actually has this library, an awesome library called Rayon, which provides optimistic uh, parallelism. What that means is that the decision on whether or not to parallelize is made dynamically at runtime based on the utilization of your CPU cores. So all I've changed here is that I changed iter to parallel iter, and now this will run in parallel. I'll show you one last way to write a uh, average function, and that's to use reduce. Some of you might know that as the function that was removed in Python 3. Uh, but in Rust, it's called fold. And so it starts with a single value, and then it uh, and then we pass it an operator, which says how to take successive values and combine them into one. So this is an example of a closure. Uh, if you're more familiar in Python, that's uh, called a lambda. And this has the same uh, result. But the difference is that in dynamic languages, if you use a lambda, or in Python, if you use a lambda, that normally adds runtime overhead, because the interpreter has to call back into your function for each iteration. Whereas in Rust, uh, Rust is able to optimize across this function call and inline it automatically as appropriate. And so this will take the same amount of time. And just to prove that to myself and uh, to show you, I actually wrote all four of these versions uh, and benchmarked them. So you can see that the three sequential versions all run in the same amount of time. And the parallel version uh, ran faster, but also it sometimes ran slower, and the variance was a lot higher. So that's something I'm not completely sure why it happens yet, but something to look into. So that's a quick uh, intro to the language. So now I'm just going to talk about uh, types and traits in Rust. So we've already seen the primitive uh, types, the 64-bit uh, floating point value. Uh, these are the other types that Rust provides. I'll just mention that Rust has a built-in Boolean type, which I think was uh, a really good decision. And it's also used, uh, so Rust forces arguments to conditionals to be Booleans. So there's no concept of truthiness or falsiness, like in Python. Uh, and C, which doesn't have this Boolean value, there's different conventions on what represents success or failure. Sometimes it's 1 and 0. Sometimes it's 0 and negative 1. And that's led to a number of security issues in high-profile cases. So Rust, I think, made a really good decision with, uh, with that. And characters are actually 4-byte Unicode code points. 
And then Rust also has a number of more complex types that you can build out of those. Uh, I'll just point out that arrays, something that I found interesting is that these are stored on the stack. And the length of the array is actually a part of the type information, which means for arrays on the stack, Rust can check at compile time for uh, certain uh, bounds access. And then arrays of different lengths won't unify. But the main way to create uh, more complex data structures in Rust is by using a struct. So this is similar to how you would do it in C. You, here's an example of a rectangle with two fields, the width and the height. And structs don't have uh, methods associated with them. They only have the data. And in Python, normally you're used to using classes where you can put both the data and all the methods and functions associated with it. Uh, this is an example using the adder library for Python, which if you're not using it, I highly recommend. And there's, here's how you would do the same type of thing in Rust. So here's the same uh, struct. It's a person with a name as a string. And then separately from that, you create what's called an inherent implementation. Uh, so this is a collection of methods that will be available on all instances of uh, this person type. And a bit like Python, the methods take an explicit self-parameter. <coughs> so for those of you coming from object-oriented languages, you might be more familiar with classes as the way to achieve the three principles of OOP, which are inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. But Rust doesn't really have classes. What it has instead is something called traits. Traits are a bit like interfaces in other languages, or if, uh, like type classes in Haskell. Uh, they're used for a number of things. So uh, they're used for operator overloading, so to customize how addition or subtraction works, or other operators. They're also used as indicators of behavior. So if a type uh, can be copied uh, or sent between threads safely, those, that's used as uh, a trait. That's done by in implementing a trait. They're also used as uh, bounds on generic methods. And you can also use them for opt-in uh, dynamic dispatch at runtime. So here's how you define a trait. You use the trait keyword, give it a name. So this says uh, any, uh, thing, anything implementing this trait needs to have uh, this name method that returns a string. And it's not like duck typing in Python. You actually uh, explicitly need to implement this. And here's how you would uh, use that trait. You use the same impl keyword, uh, and you're saying you're implementing the trait for that type, and then you put something which has uh, the same uh, signature. And you'll notice that here we're actually returning self.name.clone. And the reason you need this brings me to the second thing about Rust, which is the concepts of ownership and borrowing. So. <laughs> So for me, this was the most difficult part of Rust to learn uh, and to understand. But I also think it's the most interesting part of it. And it's really, I think, a major breakthrough in language design. Uh, and the, the running joke is that you'll be fighting with the borrow checker for your first couple of weeks of using Rust. Um, but I think it's worth it to, once you get past that. Um, and also, this is what really provides the, the guarantees of safety and of uh, data race freedom in Rust. So I think it's easier to understand with an example. Here's a, a vector. So we're creating this on the heap. Uh, the elements are stored on the heap, and then we have a pointer to it. And uh, v has ownership of that resource. So as soon as v goes out of scope, and as soon as this function returns, that data on the heap is freed. So this isn't like C, where you need to manually call free for data that you've allocated. And if I assign this to another variable, like w, that ownership has been transferred to w. And if I then try to use v afterwards, we get an error. And that's because that ownership has been moved, and we can't use that, that variable anymore. Let's look at another example. So here's a function called print. It takes a uh, vector and prints it. And so here, if we, if we call print, this call transfers ownership into the function. And when print returns, that data is freed, which means that if we try to call print again with that same variable, we'll get an error. So if we want to fix this, you'll notice that all we had to do was change this and add an ampersand. So this means that we're actually taking what's called a borrow. We're going to borrow the value instead of transferring ownership. So now when we call this and pass in uh, a reference instead with the ampersand, we're not giving it ownership. We're, giving it, we're lending it. We're giving a lease to this variable. And then when it returns, it doesn't get freed, because this still keeps ownership which means that now we can call it a second time, and this is OK. If you want to have a function which modifies the reference that it's passed, 
you have to explicitly say that it takes a mutable reference. And also, you have to pass a mutable reference here. So borrowing fo follows a number of rules that are what guarantee the properties of um, memory safety. The first is that mutable borrows are exclusive. Once you have a single mutable borrow to a object, you can't have any other active borrows at the same time. And the second is that a borrow can't outlive the object that is being borrowed. So just to show you two examples of that, uh, here's the first one, that if you have a number of borrows to an object, as soon as you try to take a mutable one, because those are still active, this is forbidden. And Rust will give you a compile time error. And here's another example with a, what's called lifetimes. So if you have this outer variable, and then inside the scope, you have a variable v, and you try to assign it a reference to, of, to that variable to the outer, uh, as soon as this goes out of scope, v is going to be freed. And so this gives you an error saying that v doesn't live long enough. So I've kind of, uh, I think it's probably too much to cover in one talk all of this. You could actually uh, probably do a whole talk just on this subject. It's based off something called uh, a concept in logic called substructural logic. And for those of you who are familiar with um, the Curry-Howard isomorphism, which is this uh, correspondence between types in type theory and proofs and propositions in logic, uh, this is a type system known as affine types. And it's actually an active area of research uh, to prove that this system is uh, consistent and safe. So I'll get to the main point of the talk, which is how you can use Rust to uh, speed up your Python code. Uh, there's two options, really, for doing this. The first is by using CFFI and uh, calling out into, and making a library in Rust that follows the C calling convention. The benefit of that is that it'll work with any interpreter, but the problem is that your Rust code won't have access to uh, the interpreter objects. And the second way of doing that, which is what I'll talk about today, is by using the C Python bindings. And so the benefit of this is that you can actually access a lot of the interpreter internals. However, you're limited to the C Python interpreter. And to make this more exciting, I'm going to do this as a live demo. <laughs> and hopefully the demo gods are with me today. Okay. Can you see my screen? So I have a function here in Python called uh, count doubles. And what this does is it takes a string, and it looks for the number of uh, pairs of characters that are identical. So two A's in a row, or two B's in a row, and so on. So I have a variable called total, and I loop through the string, with zipped with the string offset by one. So this gives me pairs of characters in the string. And if they're equal, I increment the total, and then I return it. So this is a bit slow in Python. There's a way to speed it up, which is by using a regex, which does the exact same thing. Uh, but maybe you want to make this even faster. And to do that, you can actually write a, Pyth uh, a Rust extension module. So let me show you how to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new crate, or which is what Rust calls packages. Um, and this is using Cargo, which is the package manager for Rust. So what this has created is a folder here. And we have a Cargo Tomo file. This is a bit like setup.py in Python. And so this is where we specify the dependencies. So first, if I wanted to just pull in the latest released version, I could say this of the CPython bindings. But to get the latest and greatest, I'm going to pull this in from GitHub. And the other thing we want to say is that we're building a shared library. So I'm going to give this library a name. This is what we import it as from Python. And then I'm going to say that I'm building a crate whose type is a dynamically linked shared library. So that's all we need for this file. Uh, and then we, Rust, or Cargo, has also created this file called uh, lib. And this is where we put our code. So the first thing we're going to do is pull in the uh, CPython crate. And we want to use all of the macros that that crate defines. And now I'm going to pull in a couple of types from that crate. The first is Python, and the second is PyResult. And I'll explain these in a second. And now I'm going to build the function. So this is count doubles. This is what's going to count the number of pairs of characters in my string. The first argument is going to be this Python object. The second one is the string. And this returns a pi result. So this pi result is the object that lets us raise Python exceptions if we want to. And it's generic over this uh, unsigned 64-bit uh, number. 
So then we're going to write uh, just the function. But what I want you to notice is how similar this is to the Python version. So I have the total, and then I loop through the pairs of characters in the characters of the string, and then I zip this with the characters uh, offset by one. So this is very similar to the zip call in Python. And now if those two characters are equal, I'm going to increment the total. And then I'm going to return. Well, I don't need to return. I'm going to say that there was, everything was OK and return the total. So this is all we need. This is just 10 lines of code. And now we're going to make this importable from uh, Python. Initializer. And this is a macro that uh, the CPython bindings define. We pass it the name of our module and then the name of the function for Python 2 and 3. And then the last argument here is a closure, which receives a module object and lets us modify it and add different methods to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a um, function to this module, call it count doubles. Oh. You're supposed to tell me if I make a typo. Uh, and we use this pyfn macro, which builds the Python version of the function. So here's count doubles, and then we also give it the type that we want it to be. The, the arguments. And that's all we need for this, and just say OK. So that's, that's all we need. Now if I go back to my terminal, I go into this folder. And if everything went well, this should build um, the package for us. And while that's going, I'll just explain what this Python object was that I mentioned. So this is a reference to the Python interpreter. And there's something in Python called the global interpreter lock. And any access to interpreter internals needs to be holding this lock. And the way that Rust uh, achieves this, or that the Rust bindings achieves this, is by having, using the lifetime concept and saying that as long as you have a reference, or as long as you have this object alive, you have the, the interpreter lock. So this is a really nice way of um, getting around um, having to do this manually in C. Okay, so this is done. So you'll notice that what's been built in here is this example uh, shared library. So what I can do is I can copy it. Uh, I'll copy it to example.so. And this means that it can be found by Python. And now if I import example, it's a, just a simple Python module that has this count doubles function. And I can pass it a string, and it'll tell me how many pairs of characters it found uh, inside that string. Oh, oh, sorry. Better? OK, uh, so yeah, so this tells me how many uh, times uh, there were pairs of characters in the string. Uh, and just to show you that the bindings will also do automatic marshalling of the types. So if I try to pass this something that's not a string, I get a type error. And just to show you the comparison in terms of performance, uh, we can compare all of those different versions uh, of the count doubles function. So this is benchmarking all three versions. And we can see that the Rust one took about, uh, here's the mean, took about two milliseconds on average. The regex took about 30 milliseconds, so 12 times slower. And then the pure Python one took about 60 milliseconds, so about 30 times slower. And I ran this test in uh, PyPy just to check. And uh, it's still about five to eight times slower than the Rust one. So just to wrap up. Uh, Yeah, so just to wrap up, uh, I think Rust is a really good way to uh, speed up critical parts of your code. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. I hope I've piqued your interest. Um, and one of the Rust community's big focuses in 2017 is the story of the integration with other languages like Python. So expect to see a lot of improvements in how Cargo and Setup tools work together. Uh, and these are just some references that I would recommend taking a look at. Um, and that's it. Thanks. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so please put your hand up, and I'll get you the mic after uh, we're in sequence here. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just wondering, in your uh, Rust module, right at the bottom, as you were hooking it up yes. uh, into the module, um, you quietly put a question mark at the end of it. Yes. <laughs> What's up with that? What's that doing? Um, I can explain. So there's uh, the error type in Rust 
uh, Rust doesn't have the exceptions like uh, Python does. It has this error type. Uh, this question mark is new syntax in uh, Rust 1.14, I believe, or 1.13, uh, that was just released. And what that does is it basically checks for an error, and if there's an error, it raises it up and returns it as a, uh, and coerces it into an error of the appropriate type. So it's a bit like uh, try catch, but um, it's used so often that they added specific syntax for it. But. Hey, so. Um uh, Rust has a bunch of like specific stuff like borrowing and ownership that Python doesn't have. So like I see in your function count doubles, you're taking a, you're taking a, you're not taking ownership, you're borrowing it. Yeah. So what happens if you don't borrow and you take ownership? So like from Python, you have to think about that stuff. Be like, oh well, I'm calling a function. I can only call a function that's taking a borrow of a, my variable, not ownership or something like that. Like how, do you have to think about that kind of stuff when you're calling Rust functions from Python? So you do have to think about it a little bit. Um, so uh, the, the bindings, what they do is they'll uh, figure out that um, ownership uh, implies that you have a reference count, basically. So the CPython interpreter uses reference counting as its way of doing garbage collection. Uh, and what you, so yes, if you take a borrow, then it'll increment the reference count and then, um, or I don't think it needs to increment it at all, but if you're not taking a borrow, um, I think the bindings will actually check that for you and make sure that it's, um, those are handled appropriately. So it, it's something to be aware of, um, but what's nice is that the compiler will check uh, on these lifetimes, and so you end up having the same type of safety properties. There's still some things to be figured out. Rust is looking into how you could write custom garbage collectors uh, and how you could integrate those with other languages' garbage collectors. So that's one of the active like topics of research, uh, and that's ongoing. Help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I noticed that uh, most of the magic methods uh, in Python are regular methods, and they're objects. Uh, yeah. Does that apply to all objects, or just some of them? And could you repeat that? For example, uh, zip, which is a, f a, f a function in Python, is yeah. a method in the in Rust. Oh yes. Uh, how does that work? Does do all objects have such methods? Oh, so this is a method. It's called the same thing in Rust, but this is a method that's uh, part of native Rust iterators. So you'll notice here what I'm taking isn't a Py, like isn't a Python object. I could do that if I did this, and then I would have access to all of the methods on the Python methods on this object. But what I'm taking is actually this reference to a string. And what that means is that the bindings will marshal this into a native Rust string, and it doesn't do a copy. It actually converts it to UTF-8, and then the string is a pointer into the Python string object. Uh, and the characters is a method on Rust strings that returns an iterator over the characters. And then zip is a method of Rust iterators. All iterators in Rust, yeah. That, did that help? Uh, if I want to distribute a Python package that includes a Rust module as yeah. a source distribution, yeah. uh, what will my end consumers need to have to be able to set that up? Uh, so I've been doing a little bit of work on this. Um, you, they'll need, obviously, the Rust uh, compiler uh, if they're going to compile it from source. There's a setup tools package called Rust EXT, which tries to make that as seamless as possible. So you can just have a setup.py file and say that there's a Rust file that gets compiled. Um, I think that can still use some improvement, um, but ideally it would be just as simple as having a regular Python package, adding a little Rust code, and adding something in setup.py, and then distributing that to anybody who has um, the Rust compiler installed. Um, yeah, did that, did that help? Uh, are you currently using Rust um, right here? Oh, fair <laughs> yeah. Are you currently using Rust um, at work or personally and Python together? As, or, well, uh, at work and Python together. So I am not. Uh, so we work. I work at SurveyMonkey, and we mostly do web. Or I work on the enterprise team, and we build web applications. And for the most part, I think Python is actually really good and, and good enough actually for uh, for that. So there haven't been any cases where we need to have something that's a lot faster. Uh, this has been more of a kind of hobby and just a passion. That's something that I've been excited about. And maybe we can use it if something comes up where we need something that's faster. Yep. Anyone else? Any other questions for Samuel? No. Okay. Cool. Well, Thanks. thank you very much.